coaches conduct a practice session? What's important to them? And when I go watch a practice, it, it doesn't take very long. Is that for me? <laughs> it doesn't take very long for me to know what the emphasis of that practice is. And so if I would come and watch your practice, I could pretty much tell in the first you know, hour of practice what you, what you think is important. And then hopefully your team thinks that's important. So uh, I go back to you know, what you emphasize in practice is what your players will emphasize in game situations. Now, I think there's only about three things that you can do well as a team. If you think about your team, what are three things your team does well? I, I don't think you can do ten things well. I think when you think, I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to press, I'm going to play half-court man defense, we're going to run a fast break, we're going to do these ten things very well, you're not going to do any of them very well. So it's important that you figure out what three things you really want to do well. Now, I'll, I'll go watch Tom Izzo at Michigan State. And I, I go watch his practice. And after the first 10 minutes, I know the one thing that he emphasizes that his players do really well is rebound. I mean, that's what they do. So that's obviously one thing that I come away with with his points of emphasis. And so he emphasized that in practice. He spends a lot of time on drills rebounding. He, he applauds his players when they rebound well. He makes corrections on the rebounds. That's the part of the game that he really wants his players to come away with and do in ball games. So that's one of them. Second one, I think, he, had, he gets his kids to play hard. Now, playing hard is a term that's really kind of ambiguous. So what do we really mean by playing hard? I think you can gauge, I think there's some things that you can do to gauge how well, you, how hard your team is playing. So I think there's about five areas of playing hard that, that your team needs to, you kind of need to consider uh, if your team's playing hard. Uh, first one is 50-50 balls. Does your, team, does your team go after, get 50-50 balls? And what I mean by that is if there's a loose ball, whether it be on a rebound or whether it be on the floor, there's about, usually about 10 or 12 of those a game that either team can get. And we, we chart this. How many does your team get? If your team gets 2 out of 12, that's not very good. If they get 7 out of 12, that's pretty good because that's 7 more possessions they can get on a 50-50 ball. It might be a, a tip rebound. It might be a, a ball that's gone off somebody's bad pass and somebody can get. How many 50-50 balls does your team get? I think that's something you need to chart and think about. That gives you an idea how hard your team is playing. I think taking charges is a, an indication of how hard your team can play. Uh, I would say taking charges from the help side over uh, is an indication. So can you get one or two a game uh, on those? And I think my uh, experience with international coaches or referees is they love to give this sign. You know, so I think if you're there a little bit, uh, it seems to me you always you kind of get that call. Uh, a third thing that we chart uh, is deflections. So <clears throat> deflections are anytime you get a finger, a hand, a fingernail, a foot to disrupt the offense, that's a deflection. And uh, again, we chart that. I think that tells us how uh, how ready we are to play defense, how intense we are, how quick we are uh, to play defense. And we like to get four deflections per quarter. That means that we're, you know, we hope to get, that doesn't necessarily mean a steal. We may bat the ball, we may hit it, we may, um, like I said, just get a fingernail on it, uh, but it disrupts what we're doing with the offense. So those are deflections. Extremely important to do that. And uh, number four, to gauge how, how hard your team is playing, I think free throws. Uh, we obviously like to shoot more free throws than our opponent. In a perfect world, uh, uh, Tom Izzo has a great point. He likes to, sh 
He likes to make more free throws than his opponent shoots. That's pretty difficult. So if you make 20 free throws and your opponent shoots 18 total, you got a pretty good leg up on that. So I think free throws are really uh, an important part of, of playing hard. The last thing, number five, uh, that we all kind of engage is rebounding. And specifically, offensive rebounding. Specifically, offensive rebounding. So, uh, how many offensive rebounds can we get? That gives us an extra shot, an extra possession. That tells us how hard we, we can play. And basically, the, you look at these five things. Taking a charge, 50-50 balls, uh, deflections, uh, free throws, shoot more free throws, and rebounds. Of those five things, and we tell our we tell our uh, our U16, U17 national team players this. Of those five things, how much skill is involved? Zero. There's very little skill involved in those things. So it doesn't matter what kind of player you are. If you're an elite player, if you're a player who's learning the game, it doesn't matter. You can do those five things. And if you're not the best player on your team, the emphasis is can you do these five things to help our team win, to help our team be successful. So I think that's a great point to get across to your team. It takes zero talent to really get a 50-50 ball, take a charge, get deflections, shoot free throws by being aggressive and rebounding. Uh, now obviously talent may help in those, but uh, it's just it's just flat out hard work. So when we say a goal is to play hard, I think you need to define what playing hard is. Uh, I love these, and I love coach when I go to go to a high school game. And, you know, the coach will stand up and be yelling, "Guys, got to play harder." Well, that's they don't know what playing harder is. You got to define that. So that that's I think that's a term that we that we didn't talk about last night that I wanted to make sure we talk about and. That's part of your culture. That's part of your culture as a team. So how your team plays is part of what your culture is. Now, uh, I think as I go view teams, and I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't know what uh, level you coach at, but there's a lot of teams that have championship talent. Flat out, they're good. I mean, that's you see that in, uh, in the NCAA, you see it in high school, uh, but they don't have champion. But the but to go along with that, they don't have championship habits. I think that's where you as a coach comes in. Come in. You have to develop championship habits on your team. So if you have a, a team that's made up of good players and championship habits, that's a good mesh. If you have a team that's just average with championship habits, that's where you can exceed what you think you should do <coughs> or where your team exceeds what they think they can do. The biggest joy in coaching is when you have a team that is a very average team that exceeds expectations. That's, a, that's one of the greatest joys in basketball, in my opinion. Um, you know, the, the joy comes from watching those players get from point A to point B skill-wise and how to play hard and being great teammates and coming, coming together to make a championship team and finish maybe 16 and 14, as opposed to eight, eight and 18. The, that's, that's one of the biggest joys in coaching, to ex exceed maybe what you did. And part of that goes with the habits that you create. And that's your culture. Habits are a culture. If you're, gonna, if you're going to define culture, what is culture? If you're going to define culture. Norms, huh? like the norms. The thing that's normal. Okay, what's what's your norm? Yeah, that's part of you think around here. Huh? The way we do things around here. The way you do things in our environment. The way you do things in your environment. Team's identity. Team's identity. Okay. <coughs> Give me an example. Uh, the values. The values. So how the team how the team views situations. How they value themselves. Uh, it could be a it could be a particular style of defense or it could be a particular style of offense, or it could be just just behaviors of the players off the court in general, but, but obviously the identity of the team. Yeah, all these are, are great examples of culture. Yeah, now, 
The key to it is how is that developed? The key to it is how, because sometimes that can be developed in a team very easily, and sometimes that takes a real struggle, and that's where a coach, the coach comes in to develop that culture. I define culture simply as, and put these three together, I define culture simply as this, how you do things. Culture is how you do things. And uh, it wasn't that long ago that USA Basketball had uh, a very negative culture surrounding it. Uh, back in the mid-2000s, I think we finished sixth, is it, in the, in the uh, World Championships in Indianapolis. So, you know, that's by far the low, and I think we finished third in the Olympics before that. So it wasn't too long ago that our culture was not really very good. So what did we do to change around that culture? I think a couple things we did, obviously, Coach K was a big part of that um, as well. But, you know, I think we just did things a little different. I think we got our best players to play uh, that, wanted to, that really wanted to play, played in the Olympics and in the international competition. Because there, I think for a while we didn't have the players. We had players that play, but, you know, they were not really uh, giving us their best effort, didn't really want to be a part of it. So I think Jerry Colangelo, Coach K, that whole system, and that's kind of when uh, I first came aboard in 2009 with our young team. So I, was a, I, I saw part of that culture change, uh, which is really interesting to me because I sat in meetings just like this with Coach K and the Olympic team, how he developed uh, some of those culture things. And I'll, I'll, I'll get into that here in a little bit. Uh, so I think we had to change the culture around. Your team is no different. I don't care if you coach a bunch of uh, eight-year-old girls or boys or, you know, 13-year-olds or high school age kids. Your culture is really what you, what you determine. Remember I said that at the beginning, there's really only three things. You need to have three things that your team does really well. So figure out what those three things are. You know, we, we think we, uh, on our national team, we think our U16, U17, I think, the three things we do really well, I think we press really well. I think we full court press. That's kind of our what we hang our hat on. I think we can make things happen with that. Uh, I think the second thing is, I think we really uh, get from defense to offense quickly. Transition, offensive transition. I think we do really, really good. And the third thing I think we do uh, pretty good is rebound, rebound the basketball. But those, again, are things we emphasize. That's that. Are those the same three things we do on my high school team? Not necessarily. And that may change every year, depending on my personnel for my high school team. Uh, so you can't, if you have, uh, every year you cannot have the same type of culture, maybe, same type of team, because you're going to have to emphasize different things. Okay, I know I'm going kind of fast here, because we may not, uh, we may run out of time here. Uh, culture is how you do things. It's how you practice. It's how your players conduct themselves. It's how they watch film. It's how they compete in a game and practice. So I think that all those four things really involve uh, what your culture is. I get a little disturbed at our a AAU is not a correct term in the states. It's traveling team culture. I get a little disturbed at our traveling team culture. Uh, number one is the culture is no accountability. <coughs> Players go play on a weekend, uh, play three or four games, and you may disagree with me on this, but uh, uh, the traveling team culture is simply, we're gonna go play the games, and we don't care what you do outside of the game situations. And I've seen this happen. So there's no accountability to it, the players, and that's part of the culture. So now we get them in a situation where it's more structured, guess what happens? They're not used to having discipline and accountability. And so it takes a little bit to turn that around. I will give you an example. In uh, Zaragoza, we're playing in the U-17 World Championship. Uh, <clears throat> we had a uh, curfew uh, that the players needed to be in their rooms, not necessarily sleep, be in their rooms uh, by a certain time. Uh, coaches are down watching film, and we come up off the elevator, and there are four guys outside their rooms, and they're not doing anything bad. They're just outside their rooms. They're looking for snacks, as 17-year-olds do. They're hungry. 
Um, so we come up, uh, three, of, three of them will be in the top 10 draft pick uh, next year. And one, is, one will be an NBA player eventually. So as a coach, what would you do? I mean, we had some choices, you know. We never, you know, that's the thing about, we don't, t a lot of times we don't tell them exactly what's going to happen. Because I think you earn your fairness as a player. And what I mean by earn your fairness is if you're a player that's consistently late or not late, but pushing a buzzer for practice. So let's say he comes in every day, he's there one minute before practice starts. And in the classroom, he's, you know, he sits in the back and doesn't really pay much attention and the teacher talks to him about it. Uh, at, as soon as practice is over, minute practice is over, he leaves. Okay? So his teammate, he's there 10 minutes early, sits in the front row in the classroom, Teachers rave about him, has his attitude, is great. So they're both five minutes late to practice for whatever reason. They, I don't treat them both the same because he, he's earned his fairness, he's earned his fairness. And so there's a little difference there. Now, to get that across to your players is a little different. But I may, I may, I may not play him for a half or a game. And I may, and I may, if he's a starter, not starting, but bring him off the bench real quick. So your players have to understand they earn their fairness. And I, and I think that's a huge important point in the growth and development of a player, not only a player, but as a person. Uh, on that. So back to what we did with uh, Zargosa at our World Championships. We had some choices. What could, we, what could we have done with those four? What are some choices I had as a coach? I mean, on the coaching staff. Well, I mean, you, 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 if you can't discipline your best player, then you're, you lost your team. You're, I mean, your player, your best player has to be disciplined. So what are choices I had? Give me a choice. Bench them. Bench them. How long? Depends on how far away from their room they were. <laughs> They're four steps away. No. And like you said, it depends on their past history, what they've done before. Okay. They're all good kids. Okay. They were all good. You'd challenge that behavior, wouldn't you? Huh? You'd challenge that behavior. In what way? Question if it's appropriate. You think this is model behavior, etc. Okay. You wouldn't tell them you were sleeping till tomorrow. Get them to think about it tonight. Well, they don't get you sleep then. <laughs> Maybe you could ask them what they think they deserve as a punishment. Ask them what they think they deserve. That's interesting. Yeah. You did that yesterday on the court, didn't you? It's Asking them to uh, what their punishment was. I liked that. You picked that up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did the groupies to manage what the environment looks like, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, unacceptable. The group makes a decision. I think they need to be part of that. Probably next practice you have, have them all run, or have a discipline them all off of that one player. So it could be more of a team thing. It, it's time like to go, like to have curfew. Uh, all the team get together to rely on the coaches. So okay. All right, all good suggestions. I mean, don't think we didn't think about all those. What else? What else could we? What else are our options? Or maybe say if we have a leader in that group, let's sit up that leader because the others could not tolerate. So now we're kind of putting the onus on the, the, the players themselves. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Any others? Send them home. <coughs> huh? Send them home. Send them home. That's an option. Yeah. Long plane flight home for yourself. <laughs> Here's what we did. I mean, we had options. We had all these options. At the end, at the end of the day, we said, you know what? Uh, we really felt it was important that these players understand that this is not just a traveling team weekend. That it's it's important that they're held accountable for what they did. And if I throw out the names, I'm sure you recognize some of them. But we 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 did not we, we did not even dress all four. And we're talking about World Championship, U17 gold medal on the line. It was a quarterfinal game, so if you lose that game, you you have no way of getting the gold medal. We didn't dress them. Uh, we we sat them on the bench, and we said, you know what? It's a good thing we got 12 pretty good players because tonight we're only going to play eight. And uh, 
and, and we and we, we told them uh, with the team. We didn't tell them by themselves, we told them with the team. So I think it was kind of a shock to them, but they all, uh, they all understood that you know, we're, we're gonna hold you accountable. And I think if we had not done that, um, I think everybody, uh, the rest of the team would have, would have, uh, would have said, you know what, this, they're not really gonna hold us accountable for what, mm -hmm. what they say. So it was really important, you know, and we never had a problem after that. And we never had a problem with the other U16 follow, follow that group because they already heard about it. So, so what are you going to do when your best player does something that's, that's not acceptable, that's out of your culture? I think you, gotta, I think you really have to be uh, thinking about that because it's going to happen. I've, I've coached high school basketball for 42 years. And so when I was a young coach, you know, I, I, was not, I didn't hold my players as much accountable as I think I probably should have. And, and the more I coached, I realized how important that was. And it's sometimes it's easy to say to tell your good player, eh, you know what? Take take four laps. We'll call it good. You know, next time he's still going to be late. You know, they don't. Sometimes they don't get it. Question. I was just going to say, how much, how much tougher is that decision to follow through with if your team is in a position where, let's say, benching those guys or not dressing those guys almost guarantees you don't win the game? I, I think you do what you have to do. Always the dog Huh? Do you think you'd have made the same Would have made a difference. <coughs> made a difference. I mean, I've done the season. I had a guy who didn't turn up to practice. I seen on Snapchat, he'd been in, in a pub with his friend. So I didn't even register him for the game, we lost the game. But, you know, he sent a message out. You know, what's the culture? Yeah. How are you going to deal with it? You know, in the, whole, in the whole scheme of things, winning and losing is secondary. What I tell you yesterday, what I said yesterday, Winning is not a... It's the, it's the objective, goal. it's not the goal. It's the object, it's, it's, it's not a goal. Winning is not, if winning is your goal, then you're, then you're gonna have a hard time building a culture you wanna build. Winning is the objective. The goal is to develop those young people into becoming mature adults as they grow older and learn life lessons because they play for you. Because you're, you're the coach who, keeps them accountable. Now the problem with traveling teams is, you know, he, he's my best player, so I, I hold him accountable and not play him a game. He says, you know what, <coughs> screw you, I'm gonna play for this other team. That, that's the problem we have. Or I'm a high school coach, he says, F you, I'm gonna play for this other high school. And the problem is that other high school will take it. So that, that's the problems we have with it. But you know what? <coughs> you know, like I said, if, if winning is your only goal, then you're going to do what it takes to keep that player on your team, and you, and you may win some more. You may win two or three more games, but in the long run, you're going to lose a lot of the other kids. So, so I need to move on here with that. So, uh, uh, I think number the second part of this is uh, culture always precedes positive results. Culture always precedes positive results. And I found that out. I took a job at Iowa City High School, and I told you this yesterday just a little bit. Um, Mike, keep track of time for me a little bit, will you? Somebody, yeah. yeah. Let me know when, let me know when it's done. We'll 30 minutes. Okay, good. Uh, so, I, I, <clears throat> maybe I told you this where I went to a very diverse school, extremely athletic kids. We had the top, top, we were ranked in the top 50 high schools in, the, in our country as far as athletic department. Uh, but we were terrible in boys basketball. Absolutely pathetic. And that's why we, I told you yesterday we came up with our, what we're doing with our youth programs. Does that ring a bell to anybody? Okay, all right. Uh, so, so that, but part of that is I had to develop a culture, we had to develop a culture a very positive culture where kids want want to improve, they want to come to practice, and they want to get better. So, culture always precedes positive results. You know, I, I don't think you can have a poor culture and be successful in the long term. Um, and the, the second thing I'll add to that, you know what? You got to fight for your culture every day. You got to fight for your culture every day. That means just when you think everything is going really smooth. 
watch out. You know, we thought everything was going really good with our U17 team, and it was. Uh, but you know what? You have to fight for your culture on a daily basis. Just give me, let me give you just a, just a really example uh, of this. Maybe one of, your, one of your points of emphasis is your players all come to practice with their shirt tails tucked in. Okay? That's part of your culture, which is great. Maybe it isn't, but which is okay too. So they come to practice for like the first two weeks, they all have their shirt tails tucked in. They look good. And then after, this, after, this, after two weeks of practice, you know, a couple of them have their, the back of their shirt tail out. And you, don't, and you don't really mention anything, you don't say anything. And then you have a couple come with their shirt tails out, and you don't, you don't think that's important, so you don't say anything. Pretty soon that part of your culture is lost. And that's just a minor example of, of what happens. So you, got, you really got to fight for your culture every day. You know, if, if you're one who's really a stickler on when they step across that line for practice that, you know, they have to do this, this, and this, then you have to hold them accountable for it. Like if you, if you have a, uh, if you say you have to do 21 handed shots, you have to have 20 passes off the wall, whatever it is, if you're that type of coach, then you have to make sure that you hold your players accountable for that and, and that, uh, you have, to, you have to fight for that every day. How about the classroom, too? Those type of things. Okay. Uh, I learned this from Coach K. He said you, you do not teach chemistry on your team. It's hard to teach you know, having great chemistry. That comes from your culture. Okay. What did we do to end up practice yesterday? Talking. Talk, our communication circle. Right? Okay? That helps build chemistry. So the chemistry you have on your team is you don't teach it, you provide a culture for enhancing the chemistry. It's really hard to teach chemistry. And you've all had teams where you thought, boy, this team is really bonded together, really has great chemistry. And, and you don't really know how it got there. Well, you probably have good leaders and you probably have an environment, a culture that added to that. Well, after three years at City High, we got the culture turned where we had a very positive culture, and now our boys' program was still not great, uh, in my estimation, on the court, but we were what we were great culture team, had tremendous positive influence on the court. So, how many have a philosophy, coaching philosophy? Nobody has a coaching philosophy? Anyone want to share your coaching philosophy? You don't have to. Your philosophy is has nothing to do with X's and O's. If your philosophy is we're going to press, we're going to rebound, we're going to fast break, that's not a philosophy. Because a philosophy uh, deals is about creating a culture. How are you going to create your culture? Because your X's and O's are going to do what? They could, they're probably going to change every year because your team is not going to be the same every year. So I have high school teams that are not the same every year. Now our national team is probably a little different because we can choose the players that fit into what we want to do X and O wise. But uh, your philosophy is about creating a culture. It's a mindset. Uh, you're striving to, to establish a culture you want on your team. One of the things we do before, before every practice is we have a team meeting. It might be five minutes, it might be two minutes, but I think it sets the stage for your practice. And what do we do in this team meeting? We have what we call, I think I mentioned this yesterday, mind candy, did I mention that? Okay. So we, have a, we just have a phrase every day. Here's a mind candy for the day. Uh, you know, uh, three things about success are Number one, it doesn't happen by yourself. Number two, it takes time. Number three, it's hard. <clears throat> they would write that down in a notebook, and then we would talk about that. I would say, uh, Jimmy, how does that, how does our mind candy today reflect our team? And they have to kind of think about it. You know, how does that reflect our team? You know, the success, well, it's going to take some time for us to be successful. 
it's going to be hard work, and I can't do it by myself. So they would they would relate on on paper in a notebook uh, what that what that means to our team. So I think the mind candy we call it mind candy. We post it. Uh, I think that's really been important for us, not only on our national team basis, but on, on our high school team as well. Last thing on culture, I think it involves three things. I think culture involves expectations. You know, my expectations for you when you come to practice are that you really work on your shooting because you're not a very good shooter. Do you know that? In fact, you're, you're a bad shooter. <laughs> so you <need> <laughs> hey, you're not disagreeing with me, so I must be right. <laughs> So my expectations are, Johnny, uh, you know, if you really want to increase your playing time, you're going to have to come in and get you know, such some shocks up before practice. Otherwise, I can't justify really playing you if you can't make open shots for us. Okay? So now I'm giving him an expectation. Do I, do I, uh, do I make sure that he comes in 10 minutes before? No. But I'm going to say, Johnny, you have, been in, have you shot any shots before practice? You have? How many shots you how many shots you get up? Twenty five. Twenty five shots for practice? I think you better increase that a little bit. Okay. Don't you think? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Definitely. definitely. Okay. <laughs> so you agree with me. Okay. So now you're shooting some expectations. Or I might say, uh, M D. You know, I just you before practice I might say, you know, why do you think you're playing? You're you're a starter for us. Why do you think you're playing? Put a lot of work. A lot of work during practice. What do, you, what do you What do you offer to the team? Um, whatever I can offer, obviously whatever I can, you know, give to the team. Whatever whether it's yeah. passing, shooting, whether it's defense, whatever I can bring to the team. And, and and I would say, you know what? That's why you're playing. Mm -hmm. If you don't do one of those things, then you probably aren't, your your minutes aren't going to increase, probably decrease. So I expect you. My expectation for you, you're going to always guard the best offensive player. That's what you're going to do. You're going to, you're going to take, I call it, I call it the, you're going to take the snake of the other team, you're going to cut off his head. So that's your job. If you can do that, that would be great. So now you're setting expectations at, on an individual basis as well. Okay. Uh, then I think you have to hold them accountable. Number two is you hold them accountable. Uh, example, uh, mid-season, uh, we do this with again with our high school team, national team, I will hand out a sheet of paper and to our players, and on that paper will be a survey, and there will be some questions like this. Name the three, you can't name yourself, name the three hardest workers on our team. So I'll give you a little bit of quick history. I had a sophomore that was uh, a Division One player at City High. Really, on he, he could he could have went football, basketball, didn't matter. Um, but I just didn't feel he was playing at the level he should be playing. At. So I passed out this questionnaire. On the questionnaire, it had name me three name three players who are the best. Don't put your name on it. Name me three players who are your, the hardest workers on the team. Name me three players who are the best defenders. Name me three players who uh, are the best rebounders. Name me three players who have the best attitude. Name me three players who you like to play with the most. Those kind of questions. Then I took, I took them in and we reviewed those. And interesting enough, he was not on any of those. <laughs> Didn't surprise me, because I think that's what his teammates thought too. So I had a conversation with him. I brought him into the office and I go, you know, we did a survey yesterday and uh, you're our, you are our best talented player. You're most talented player. Here's what your teammates thought of your abilities. And he's feeling pretty good. I said, none of them had you as a harsh worker. None of them had you as the best defender. None of them had you as the best teammate. So what does that tell me, what does that tell you about what your teammates thought of you? This is not coming from me, it's coming from your teammates. And it, he was in shock. But I'll tell you what, that turned his whole attitude around when he felt that his teammates felt about that. Do you think some players will feel betrayed by that? They'll feel like their teammates 
they do, they're, they're fine. I mean, they're, you know, they're, we're just being honest. Hmm. You know, they're not putting, we're not putting three, we're not asking you to, uh, you know, put your three friends up there. We're just saying, you know, give me, give me the three best, three best teammates on this team. Hmm. You know, you're not one of them. Give me the three hardest workers on our team. You're not one of them. You got zero votes. That's not coming from me. I'm not telling you this. It's coming from your teammates. So what we're trying to do uh, is, is build an accountability and a discipline factor in that. Something you may want to try. Uh, you know, we've done this with our, uh, with our uh, national team as well. <coughs> Very interesting when we, sometimes I don't share any of it. I mean, we just do it for coaches, for our own benefit. Um, and sometimes if I think we need to share it with one player or two or three, uh, then we do. All right, let me, Mike, how we doing? You are 40 minutes you've been going. All right, super. So if we're done by 9, let me know what's 9 o'clock. Okay, we'll do. All right. Hey, um, <laughs> USA Basketball, if you are interested in getting a coaching license from USA Basketball, you just get <coughs> USA, it doesn't matter if you're an international coach. We have a lot of international coaches that are uh, USA Basketball licensed. You can go to usab.com and Find coaching license, click on it, and it'll give you uh, how you can become coach uh, licensed. FIBA is a lot different because FIBA rules not anybody in, in the states. Anybody can come off the street. Anybody can come off the street, get eight players together, and call themselves a coach. That's disgusting to me. That, that takes the term coach and makes it about as low as you can get it. So we're trying, we have about 40,000 coaches licensed in, our, in the country right now. We'd like to get that up over 100,000. So at least there's some accountability for coaches that they have some process. I know, I know FIBA does a much better job of this than we do. So we're trying to, and soccer does a great job with it uh, as far as coaching. So if you're interested in that, you just go to usab.com uh, and you can become a, uh, uh, become a licensed uh, licensed coach. Anybody hear that? Anybody that's a licensed coach? Yeah. Can you access a lot of resources too? There's loads of videos and stuff on the web. Yeah, great videos. Our curriculum uh, that you can get on online. So yeah. On, uh, in terms of soccer, when we uh, recently did very badly in an international tournament. They started reporting in the papers how many qualified coaches we had in this country, which was, uh, I can't quite remember, but below a thousand. And then in every other European country, the number went up 3,000, 19,000, 20 something thousand. Uh, Spain had maybe 30,000, and that showed up the difference. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm about as ignorant in soccer as I am in technology. So those two things kind of go hand to hand, <laughs> uh, which is obviously not very good. All right, let's uh, let's move on with the. Okay, you don't need your basketball. What do we got next? Keep going. Yep. Keep going. All right, gold standards. Here's what uh, actually Coach K started this. I think it's something that certainly is part of our culture. is uh, he developed uh, what they call gold standards. We have taken these standards that he used for the Olympic team and uh, we've, we've taken them for our own personal team, my high school team. Um, interesting, my eight-year-old grandson, his coach uses some standards. Um, I'll let you take a, if you want to take a picture, uh, I can actually pass one around, but you can take a picture on your phone of, of these if you want, take a look at it. If you email me, I can certainly, I'll give you my email, I can certainly send you one. But these are 15 things that we feel are really important developing a gold standard. Uh, I was sitting in a, in a room just like this 
with Coach K and the Olympic team. Uh, actually, it was in London. It was before, before. I think it was in London, actually. Uh, they were talking about gold standards. And, uh, you know, they were, they were discussing what gold standards are, you know, how to get to them and what, really what they are. And so LeBron James raises his hand and he says, you know, uh, I've always wanted to play with the best players in the world on my team. And now I get to play with Carmelo Anthony and Jason Kidd and Kevin Durant and, you know, Stephen Curry and Chris Paul and all those guys. So now I get that opportunity, that chance. He said, we have no excuses. Coach K said, that's great. He said, that's going to be our number one goal standard. No excuses. So as they talked as a team, and I thought it was really intriguing to me that how that team came together chemistry-wise in developing these gold standards. And so uh, I'm just going to go quickly through these. Uh, you know, no excuses. I think we all kind of have players who give us excuses, and worse yet, parents who give us excuses. Um, so we really don't take any excuses for, for our play, whether it be good or bad, there's no excuse for it. Uh, number two is great defense. Uh, this is the key to winning the gold, uh, the dirty work, the playing hard, all that deals with defense. Now, however, you remember yesterday what I say about uh, practice time on defense. 20 minutes, 20 minutes, from the, from 20 minutes from an hour. Right. It, it's less than you work on with offense. Why? Because offense does takes <coughs> what? Skill. Oh. Skill. Takes the ball. You got to do ball skills. Defense, you don't have to do ball skills. What do we say about those five things that we listed earlier about playing hard? No skill. It doesn't take skill. Using the basketball, those that, that takes skill. Okay. So number two is great defense. Number three, we have is communication. You know. Uh, what did I tell them in the communication circle last night? What did I make the players do when they talk to each other? Building okay. trust. Building trust, what do they have to do though? Eye contact. Eye contact. Players don't know how to communicate. They don't understand what eye contact is. I think sometimes coaches are the same way. You know, we sometimes we're afraid to make eye contact with with one of your players. So when I'm making expectations, you know, you and I talked last week about getting shots up, right? Yeah. And you told me what? I took 25. And I, I, what did we decide then? You need to take more. You need to take more. Yeah. It'd probably help your shooting out. Yes, sir. Right? And the bottom line is, you know, we want to get, I'm trying to get you more playing time. So, so as I communicate, I'm looking him right in the eye. I mean, and he's looking me in the eye. So now that builds trust and confidence in each other. So I think as coaches, we got to be careful that we uh, don't talk too much as to a group and we, we focus in on our, on our building accountability. And the second part of that is, really important part of that of communication is we tell each other the truth. So, MD, you know, what did I tell you last week about what I want you to do? What, why, you know, in, in, in your, what, what's your main role? Uh, to play defense on the guard. Cut off the snake's head. Yeah. yeah. So that's you know, so that's that's what we're we're, we're we're telling the truth about that. You know, if you score zero points, I don't care. You may care, but I don't care. Your mom may care, and your dad may care. <laughs> I don't care because you're not on the floor to score points. You're on the floor to uh, play defense. Play defense. I'm talking about. Okay. So you're very honest with your players. Uh, we find out that in our national team and even our maybe my high school team. Kids younger, they very rarely have somebody in their lives that tell them the truth. They very rarely have anybody that tells them the truth because, you know what? If I tell him the truth, he might get pissed off and go play for another team. And I, you know, that's going to hurt our team. I need him really bad because he's my best player. I'm going to kind of tweak my culture thing here to keep him on my team. So nobody really tells him, you know, you know what, you better quit screwing off the classroom because that's going to affect you. 
So nobody really tells them what they need to hear. And so as a coaching staff, I think it's important that you let them know what they need to hear, but have them understand, I'm telling you this for your own benefit. Trust, number four is trust, huge thing. How do you develop trust in your team? How do you develop trust in your team? Any ideas? Yeah. Deliver on what you say you're gonna deliver. Deliver on what you say you're gonna deliver. <coughs> Never make a promise to them and not fulfill it. So example, the winner of this free throw contest is gonna get a pair of socks. Players love socks. You ever notice that? <laughs> huh? They love it. Mm. I mean, they would do anything for a pair of socks. So, you know, we get some Nike socks, and the winner of this free throw game uh, will get a pair of socks. So, you have the free throw game. I'll give it to you after practice, you say. Uh, and you, after practice, he goes by, and you don't give it to him, forget about it. You know what, a week later, a month later, goes by, six weeks later goes by, he doesn't forget that. And, and you have betrayed him yeah. because you've told him, promised him, you were gonna get him a pair of socks for that free throw. Sure. Now that's a little thing, but I'll guarantee they remember that. So whatever you promise, you better deliver. Question. Now I was speaking to you yesterday, yesterday about a promise made to my wife with uh, the boss of short that bank account. Yeah. He just still remembers that to today because he actually told him but, to send a, a pair of shorts. Yeah. A like USA short store. That's been what, how many years ago? Nine years. And she still wears those shorts? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! I better send her another pair. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's just a little example, but if you're going to build trust in your team, whatever you say you're going to deliver, you better deliver. And it can be just little things. It can be, you know, hey, we're going to have a pizza. We're going to have I have you up. We're gonna, I'm going to take you guys out for pizza the next time we get 20 deflections in a game. 20 deflections come and go and you don't get them out for pizza. They remember that. So your trust factor is going down. So, uh, number five, collective responsibility. You know, we're committed to each other. So just I'm sorry to interrupt. So Philly's left and we've got the gym. So if you want to go another nine, ten minutes, and then we'll bring you guys all down. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Um, bring you guys down, get you with other coaches, and, and get started a little bit earlier um, so we can maybe get you guys out a little bit earlier as well um, uh, this evening. Not much earlier, but a little bit earlier. Um, We're staying on midnight. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. And it's warm in here. I can feel why. <laughs> all, right. all right. Sounds good. Thanks, Dion. All right. Collective responsibility. You know, we're committed to each other. Being great teammates. What did I do yesterday during practice a lot? To develop, to develop good teammates. Remember what I did? High fives. Yeah, hey, give, give two players on your team a high five. It doesn't seem like much, but it carries a lot of weight. It carries a lot of weight. Uh, care, we have each other's back. You know, we would give aid. One thing about, you know, I love teams that when somebody dives on the floor after loose basketball, four guys rush over, pick them up. You know, if you're watching Michigan State, they do that better than anybody. Uh, so that you know, that's just a part of caring about your teammate. You know, they made a great effort, and now we're going to show them how much we care that he's done that. You know, the teams that don't really do that or that don't that don't get into that, I, I just don't think they have what it takes to be a really good team. Number number seven, respect. Uh, we respect each other and our opponents. Respect, the, Jason Kidd said this in the meeting. He said part of respect is we're always on time. That's part of respect. Because you respect each other, we're gonna be on time to meetings. We're gonna be on time to the bus. We're gonna be on time here. That's part of respect. And uh, if any of you, if Jason Kidd, for him to say that, it's pretty good. Uh, we're always prepared because you respect them. Number eight's intelligence. Part of it, part of intelligence is. Uh, Johnny, you've been getting your shots up. Yes, sir. <laughs> how many did you take today? Fifty-seven. Fifty-seven shots. Did you, did you count how many you made? Yes. How many did you made? Forty-two. Forty-two. Yeah. You're getting better. Nice job. Thank you. Okay. Now, now part of part of intelligence is, uh, I would say, uh, 
Johnny, do you feel comfortable taking that the shots you took today in a game? Yes. Okay. So when you're open, I want you to drain those shots. Okay. So my my point is, I'm giving him a guideline that he can shoot the ball from the sh from the range he took in practice when he's open. That's intelligence is that's my shot. He knows it. This shot, Johnny, did you take any three point shots today? Yes. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> stay stay to your mid range shots. Because that's where you're gonna get most of your shots, Johnny. You know? When you start to get out the three point shots, you're gonna hear a, a sound you don't want to hear. You know what that sound would be? Mm -hmm. eh. yeah. <laughs> so so I'm just telling you, stay in the two point range. Okay. Okay. So I mean we're helping him intelligence wise understand that you know what? I, I'm gonna take two point shots. I'm going to take three point shots. Uh, and also, part of this is knowing the scouting report. We have players prepare scouting reports for us. So I might say, uh, uh, Billy, you and, you and Ted today are going uh, for, in two weeks, you got, uh, you got Iowa City West scouting report. So you come in, look at the film, you, you devise your scouting report. So it gives them an ownership of what's going on. I, I love that part of it. And, and uh, we even do this with our national team somewhat. Give, me, give, us a, give us a scouting report on the team we're gonna play. You know, if nobody else knows it, those two will surely know it, right? The rest of them may not understand it, but those two will surely get a good picture of what the scouting report is. Number nine, poise, showing a weakness, or try to show as little weakness as possible. And number 10, flexibility. Flexibility includes we don't complain. Flexibility includes we don't complain. We are flexible enough that we can adjust the game situations. I'll go back to over coaching and under teaching. The game is way over coached, way under taught. So when you teach the game, you are allowing for flexibility. How much, how many plays in the, uh, in, do you think, what percent of the plays that are run in college and NBA end up being broken plays? Give me a percent you think. Whoo, that's pretty high. Why practice any plays in, right? 70%. 70 percent. 70% of the plays that start don't end up in how they're supposed to. So we're talking about flexibility. So. As a coach, we, we don't tell players, we don't play, say you have to run this play. We say, we're going to give you this set to play out of. And I'll say that again. We don't, we don't give a, you a play to play out, to play. We give you a set to play out of. So it might be a ball screen set, and then you play out of it. And that's what you're practicing. That's your flexibility. So as a coach, you're teaching them how to play um, and letting them figure it out. So that drill I did last night, three on zero, four on zero cutting, I give them that set, and then they're playing out of that set. They're not having a certain play to go. That's, that's teaching the game. That's not over coaching. Over coaching would be now you got to go here, here, and here. Let them figure it out. Um, number 11, unselfishness. Uh, we're correct. We're, we're connected. We make the extra pass, and key thing right here on selfishness is your value as a player is not measured in playing time. So I would say, Mike, you know, you ha you have ha you haven't gotten any minutes the last five games. I, I know you're disappointed in that. Yeah, and I know your parents are disappointed. But you're, you have brought so much to our team because you're one of our best teammates. You encourage the players. You're coming off the bench. We would not have a successful season without what you're doing. So let your players know that they are valued and playing time has nothing to do with that value. You know, your best player, they, you know, he thinks he's a king of the court and he's going to play guards. But if you can... Get that to your players because really, you know, you have players that are, are a vital part of your team that aren't going to play.
And that's part of how, as a coach, you try and value, get them to value their time on the team. 12 is aggressiveness. We talked about five things you do, playing hard. Uh, 13, enthusiasm. We said coaches have to bring two things to practice every day. What are they? Enthusiasm and passion. Enthusiasm and passion. If you bring those two today, every day, your, your team will have a pretty good practice. If you don't have enthusiasm, your team will have a, not a very good practice, and it's not your player's fault. Players don't have bad practices. Coaches do. And then uh, 14 is performance. Uh, performance includes one of the things that we have in performance is we have no bad practices. That, that's on, on, uh, on the coaches. And then pride, have a pride for what, what, who you play for, what your school is, what your team is. You have a big, huge pride. I think one of the things Coach K did so good is that he made it, again, it was a pride factor in the, in the guys playing for USA. There for a while, team, it wasn't a big deal. You know? And we're a little different because we play for – High school kids play for a state championship or a regional championship. They don't play for our country very much, you know, unless, you're, unless you're part of the league team. What we do is we laminate these. We have every player sign it on the back. We talk. We don't just give these out at the beginning of practice. We give these out at the uh, first day of practice, but then we'll talk about one of these things on a daily basis, you know, just maybe for two minutes. Hey, uh, Johnny. What's number, what's number three? Communication. Communication. How does that affect our team? Uh, it's going to make us more, it's going to make us more, it's going to make us better on defense. Okay, Johnny, you stand up. You tell, you tell your teammates how communication affects our team. It's going to make us better on defense. Okay, why? Uh, because then we'll be able to tell each other what's happening, who's taking a shot, who's rebounding, who's going to outlet. Um, it's going to make us trust each other also. Okay, very good, Johnny. Thank you. Thank you. Now, as a team, can we do that better today? That's a question you ask. So, uh, so we, we really cover these things on a daily basis. A lot of that's in our team meeting. Real quick, I know it's time to go. Any quick questions? Yeah. In terms of those gold standards, yep. do you take the standards that that initial group of you know, Kobe and all those guys set and use them throughout the program, or do you define those standards with each group? Yeah, we define them. We, we may change these with each group. Yeah. And, and you know what? Uh, my eight-year-old grandson's coach has, he has a list of five standards for their team. You know, uh, and they're a lot different than what our standards are. But it, I think you adjusted to your team. No, can I just say? Yeah. There's one team in England that started with these. We just had to change the pride because it has... He said, I think, to win the World Championship, but I think we can win the World okay. Championship. But we started this season with this. I was handing out to every player before awesome. the season started. So I was there, totally fine. Awesome. Great. Okay, I think we're ready to head down. And uh, I know there's a couple sessions going on. Uh, and then I'll end up uh, tonight with some defensive transition uh, work, uh, drills as well. So thanks for your attendance. Appreciate it.